Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities, the number one annuity podcast on the planet where our saying here is live in the reality, not the dream. So we only look at contractual realities. I'm very excited today to have a great friend and guest on. His name is Paul Merriman. He's done so much that I've literally got to read just a portion of his bio. <laughs> and now he's, he's laughing. But um, I'm just fortunate to, to know him. We've been you know, we communicate back and forth when it comes to annuities and things like that. But on this podcast, we're going to talk a lot, not, not that much about annuities. We'll cover a little bit, but I want Paul to tell you about what he does, et cetera. Now, a little bit about him and I'm going to read. So I'm going to look down a little bit here. So my apologies. And by the way, welcome to all the podcast listeners that are listening in the car and the treadmill, wherever you are and all the major platforms. But as you know, we also have a Fun with Annuities YouTube channel that we film this. So if you want to watch Paul and I interact on the split screen and you can see us and and all our beauty and uh, glamour, you can do that as well. Uh, and I do encourage you to do that. In addition, I have a Stan the Annuity Man YouTube video channel as well, if you wanna you know, see the 400 videos on, pro on products and things like that. Now, Paul, um, he currently is the president of the Merriman Wealth, uh, the Merriman Financial Education Foundation. Now, and that is, is what it sounds like. I mean, he is educating people, and that's what I like about him. He's all about the facts, just like I am. Brutal facts, the truth. He, he leads with the facts and the truth. There's no reason for sales pitches or anything like that. He wants you to be informed so you can make a good decision on your terms and your time frame. You know, in 1983, he founded Merriman Wealth Management, and he sold that firm in 2012. Um, from there, he did not stop following markets and, and, and giving advice from the standpoint of a 30,000-foot view, and also in the weeds, helping consumers understand markets understand financial products, and understand retirement uh, from a very straightforward approach. Um, he's written a ton of books and a ton of articles. Um, he has a brand new book out right now, um, and I'll, I'll have him tell you about that um, because it's, it's a good one. I was on a plane recently. I was flipping through it, and there's just so much in it. I was writing notes. I'm like, that would take the whole podcast. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Paul Merriman, uh, Paul, thank you so much for joining us on Fun with Annuities. Hey, Stan, it is absolutely great fun to be here <laughs> with you. This is a pleasure. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Let's start off with your book. Let's start off with the new book. Tell people the title, where they can get it, and then give them the brief overview of why you wrote it and why you think it would help people to read it. Well, the title, it, it, it says it all. We're talking millions. That's the title, everybody. It's that's called We're Talking title. Millions. And the subtitle is 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. And that it is about basically for the first time investor, but I think a lot of folks that, that um, are interested in the process of investing will enjoy it. But the bottom line is I want to get a hold of first time investors in their 20s, in their 30s, make sure they make the decisions that are in their best interest. Only them, mm -hmm. not Wall Street, not their neighbor, but for them. And so each one of these 12 ways or steps or choices or decisions literally should add an another, another million dollars to your bottom line, not only in retirement, but what you leave for your children and your charities. It pretty much says it all. I mean, that is, you need, to, you need, we're going to circle back and go through some of the steps later. But what I wanted to jump into right now, and, and people watching, uh, watching this and listen to this on the, on the podcast platforms, we're in the, the biggest raging bull market of all time. And we have, we have products that are entering the space that no one's ever seen before, which is cryptocurrencies and things like that. We're at very interesting interest rate environments. Some people call it low, some people call it high, depending on what view you're taking. 
but I would really like your, and, and before we even go in this, let's do a disclaimer, Paul. This is not advice. Do not accept this as advice. This is Paul and I having a conversation about markets that I hope that you can glean some very good information from. But if you ever want to talk to either of us, you, you know, we're going to have Paul's uh, contact information on our website. So if you want to talk to him and sign up for his stuff and read his stuff, I would encourage you to do that. But with that being laid out and people understanding that this isn't advice, this is just your brain, tell us about current markets and what you're really thinking right here. Well, it would be a little flip to say I'm not thinking. Uh, but in, at some level, uh, to be a successful long-term investor, you have to shut out all the noise. And years ago, I wrote a book entitled 101 Investment Decisions Guaranteed to Change Your Financial Future. <laughs> and every one of those forks in the road has something to do with uh, something that will be will change will change your financial future. So many people are sitting on the sidelines right now wanting to go into the market writing. I get it every day an email. How do I get into this market? Well, be, before you decide you want to get into this market, I, I would like to know if I were your advisor and I'm not, what is your, you're trying to achieve? What's this money for? How much risk are you willing to take? What rate of return do you need? Right. Tell me about your background. Have you in the future felt this way? T took the big dive and then only found out that it was bad timing. And then I'll ask you, well, are you a market timer? Oh, no, no, I'm not a market timer, you'll say. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, you act like a market timer. And so I want you, if you're going to be a serious investor for a lifetime, I'm not interested in the next week or month or year. I want you to figure out, are you a market timer or are you a buy and holder? And if you can't deal with the information but you that's that's around us, like Stan says, is a lot of crazy stuff going on right now. Really? But there's always a lot of crazy stuff going on. I've sure. I've been around this about 55 years, and I don't see anything different today than I saw 55 years ago. I that that may not sound like I have a good memory, but it's the same noise. Do you dollar cost average in? Do you lump sum average? Do you get right in there right now? dive in with all your money? For a lot of people, the answer is regardless of what the information is, dollar cost average, go in a little bit of a, at a time over a relatively short period of time. I mean, there's all these simple decisions that really don't have to do with the information. It has to do with you and who you're going to be because your success is in the end going to be about you. I agree with that. And I think instinctually people feel like they should be a market timer, like they should be able to time it. And as I tell people in the annuity side as well, you can't time that. That's a contract. You don't time contracts. Um, you don't time life expectancy. <laughs> um, but in the markets, uh, in, the, in the world that we're in, and I've been in a long time, not as much many years as you, but I've been three decades. And I always tell people, we see movements in the stock market in a day that we used to see in a year, okay? But that still doesn't change the way that you approach, you know, choosing your investments and your goals. Do you agree with that? You know, I, I, I do. And, and most people, Stan, don't have a very good sense of the past. I, I liked your opening where I don't remember exactly what you said, but you talked about the contract, about the reality. Yeah. There is no reality in this process because we can look to the past, which we do, and, and that's what we're about is looking to the past and trying to understand investing from the past because we can't know the future. So all that stuff in the past, you could say, well, what happened back in 1929 to 1938? What does that have to do with today? It has a lot to do with today because the same thing happened, only it was worse from 2000 through 2009. I mean, literally, the returns were worse in that decade than that earlier 10-year period. And so the, the, the problem is there's always the good news. There's always the bad news. 
I could make the list of why I think the market's going up. I could make the list as to why right. I think the market's going down. And the minute you start picking one of those lists to make your decisions, I think you're right, Stan. That is a market timing decision. Right. It is. Now, in the world that we're in now, which is, I call it blue water. Blue water means we haven't seen it before. We're, you know, we're sailing the ship and the blue water's ahead of us. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen the trillions of dollars of money that's being printed. We haven't seen the global nature of everything being somewhat interconnected between all markets. We haven't seen a lot of that. We certainly haven't seen COVID um, in our lifetimes or anything like that, that type of an event. Um, what do you tell people right now during this? And I know you've laid the good foundation of you can't time it, but what are you telling people as they're, as they're fearful of markets at their all time high, the printing of money and giving it away and the, and the spiraling debt, how do you address that? Well, it's, it, it doesn't seem right to say that that's all noise. Mm -hmm. But you talked a few minutes ago about this wonderful, amazing market that we've been in. Mm -hmm. Well, 75 to 99, the compound rate of return of the S&P 500 was 17.2%. You're right. And, and on top of that, from 1995 to 1999, the S&P, this is why people started to believe in indexing. And by the way, back then, indexing was the S&P 500 in people's right. minds. Right. It compounded at over 28% a year. And at the end of that five-year period, people surveyed, believed that for the next decade, that the market was likely to compound at 20 to 30% a year. So the biggest enemy, and I think every professional believes this, the biggest enemy that we have is what we believe and how we respond to the biases we have. We think that what's happened recently has way more importance than what happened before. You, know, you bring up cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. That is not part of my life because right. it's not the kind of thing that sits inside of, a, uh, of an index fund. But I can tell you this. I was on top of GameStop. I was in GameStop at under 10 with there you both go. feet. You want to know where I got out? I got out at over 300. Okay. Nice. Now, let me tell you what happened. What happened was I owned an index fund, a small cap index fund, which I happen to believe should be part of a long-term portfolio. It purchased GameStop. It had no idea what it was getting into. <laughs> but they also had disciplines about what to do, how to sell something. And they sold it at a huge, huge profit for their, for their shareholders. Had nothing to do with the story, the short sellers, the, the retail investors clamoring to get in and make some fast money. Mm -hmm. Every time I think about making fast money, I also think, remember list A and list B, there's the good news, but the bad news is losing fast money. Mm -hmm. And I know somebody so near and dear to my heart of all things. She called me and said, dad, I've made... <laughs> Oh, I'm giving you her gave away, it away for crying out loud. I'm, I just made my first investment. Now, she has investments, but they're all index funds. Oh, now she's going to learn how to do it on her own. Son of a gun. It turns out that she was in GameStop at 300, okay. but she was buying. And then she had the audacity mm -hmm. after all that I've taught her to say, well, it's only $1,000, Dad. Okay. That's the point at which I want to know what will that thousand dollars be worth when you're 65 or 70 and you want to do something special that that thousand dollars might have paid for. Right. You know, it's the thought process, the emotions that are involved in this, in this and Wall Street just there were like in the puppets. They're up there moving the strings, making us jump. We got to get out of the way of the puppeteer. We have got to do what's in our best interest. And you show me one piece of evidence that taking great risk is likely to be in your best interest. And you're going to say, well, look at Amazon, look at Google, look at, look at uh, any of these stocks that have, or GameStop, mm -hmm. look at that. I mean, that was a, a crummy company that went wild. 
But the fact is, people win lotteries. I'm happy when they win lotteries. Sure. And those kinds of things generally tend to be random events. And the people who participate in them think, what's wrong with the rest of the people? Are they stupid? Don't they see the reality? Well, there is no reality. They are the stories you just mentioned, the things to be concerned about, and saying that, well, this has never happened before. That was true at every point of investment That's history. Really good it hadn't happened before. And things are going to happen going forward that we can't predict or see. Um, and you just, you know, I think what you're saying, and, and I like this, and I think our listeners and, and, and viewers need to listen closely. Stay the course, stay in your lane. You know, I always tell people, I want you to be a 10-year overnight sensation. I want people to think about that for a second. Um, it takes time. And investing, as you're saying, in your approach for 50-plus years has been, it takes time and you have to do your research and your work. Investing's hard work. Would you say that's true? No. No? No, I wouldn't. I wow. Think, Explain I think, that. I think investing is dirt simple. All right. Explain I'm, that. That's fantastic. Well, okay. I got an idea. Read the book. <laughs> no. I understand. I flipped through it. No, you're right. But I flipped through it. No, but let, that, me, let, me, let me tell you why I say it's easy. There are a series of decisions that you must make. And I, I, I gave people 101. It's a free book. It's on my website. And, 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 and many of those had little impact on a portfolio. It might mean you make an extra thousand. Well, would you bend over and pick up a thousand dollars off the ground if it was lying there? Yes, you probably would. Yeah. So if you look at each fork in the road, and you do it in an objective, probabilistic basis rather than an emotional, hoping for the best, want to get rich soon. Right. There is the save versus spend decision. And we all know, we all know what the outcome of that is. If we don't save, we're going nowhere in terms of our long-term investments. And a lot of people, something like 25% in a survey said the only way they're going to be financially independent is to win a lottery. And unfortunately, that actually is true of way too many people. It is true. But we understand it's easy. Got to save. How much? We can debate, but got to save. And then you got to make the decision, okay, what are you going to save your money in? And some more forks in the road pop up like stocks versus bonds. Well, that just that one decision, Stan. Now, I'm not kidding when I say this, and I do my best to, to prove this. It, at least in terms of compounding over time. I mean, I, I assume you live to be old in order to do this, but it's a $10 million decision for a relatively small investor, stocks versus bonds. Wow. And yet those bonds are so unbelievably important to the people who think that Investing is nothing but a gamble. It's, it's, you might as well go to Las Vegas. You'll hear people say that, one of the many right. myths of the investment process. But the fact is, yeah, I believe in 100% stocks. I believe there are some people who could be 100% in stocks, equities, their entire life, right till the day they die, because about 7% of investors who are surveyed are doing that. So it's not like it's completely illogical, and I'm working on an article right now on that topic. But if you don't have the risk tolerance, if you're not willing to lose half your money, 60% of your money, you should not be all in a diversified equity portfolio. Right. If you're not willing to lose 100% of your money, you shouldn't be in one company. I, I, I'm from the northwest part of the country where WAMU their line was the friend of the family. Well, they weren't a very good friend of the family that owned their stock because they went out of business totally. And I know people who had virtually all of their portfolio in their 401k plan in that stock. But even a diversified portfolio is going to lose 50 to 60% of the time. Warren Buffett says that's what you got to be willing to accept. Right. Well, if you're not, if you're not, you got to make the decision. How much do I need in fixed income in the in the break? I mean, there's the gas, that's the stocks. There's the break, that's the that's that's going to be the bonds. 
And a lot of people cannot take the risk of having over half of their money in equities because they don't want to lose half. Even the idea of losing 25% is pretty scary. Yeah, so, it, makes, it makes their stomach hurt. Would you consider yourself a, a you could answer neither or some or, or either, fundamental type investor when you look at uh, the markets and investing or do you look at technical or do you look at both? Tell me what you mean by fundamental. Stan. Well, when I, I when sure I was, I that's, that's a good question. When I was, um, was first trained at Dean Witter a long, long time ago in the World Trade Two Center in New York City, you know, fundamentals were looking at the company, looking at the price to earnings ratio, looking at what they made, looking at who was running the company, looking at the, fun, the, the actual fundamentals where they're in a lot of cases today, you have traders that don't even know the companies they're trading. You know, fundamentals was actually understanding what the company did. They sold widgets. They're based in Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. That was fundamental. And then the technical for just a 30,000 foot view where the, the candlestick pre people and the people today just watching screens and charts and graphs. Do you look at either or both or none or what, what's your approach? Well, Stan, in, in what I preach, yeah, <laughs> which uh, my mother always said I probably would have made more money as a preacher, but, um, <laughs> the, but the bottom line is, I don't care a whit at all, not a whit about Nothing. any analysis of any company. My wife and I, we have almost 15,000 companies in our portfolio. When that GameStop story came out and I found out my daughter had purchased some, mm -hmm. I had to find out, do I own it? That's when I did the research about a company. I wanted to see if the index, by the way, you got in it if you were at Dimensional Funds or you were at Vanguard, you probably had it if you were in any index. I don't have the ability to analyze those things and I have no reason to trust the people that do. And let me tell you why I feel this way, Stan. I was a broker uh, for about two and a half, three years back in the 1960s. <laughs> and um, I've studied the output of the analysts who work and be, are paid a lot of money. Right. And in many cases, these people are really in a way glorified salespeople because mm -hmm. the key, as you remember, is it isn't really the information about that company. It's not the stake, it's the sizzle. What can we say about that company that'll get people to want to buy that company? No, oh, by the right. way, we're gonna be underwriting this, you know, the, the company and we gotta create this story along with the numbers. They always make it work. Every stock has a reason to buy <laughs> right. and everyone has a reason to sell. If not, there would not be a trade. And so my question is, do I trust Wall Street? Do I trust Main Street, our neighbor, our friend? Do I trust University Street, the academic community? And let me tell you about the fundamentals they believe in, because that's why I wanted to make sure I was going, going to answer the right question when sure. you asked, do I trust fundamentals? I would say I trust the fundamental 90 plus year result of academic studies that conclude there are asset classes that make more than other asset classes. And you and I would have no problem understanding the idea that penny stocks as a group is not something that people are likely to do well with. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of evidence that the S&P 500 will in fact produce a good return. In fact, I think John would John Bogle would say yeah. a good enough return, because <laughs> if you look at every 40 year period since 1928, the worst 40 year period was a compound rate of return of 8.9. Turned out that was during a period of time that inflation was relatively low. So it was not a bad return. The best was a period, the 40 years, that compounded at 12.5. So that's the best and the worst. That's a fairly narrow range. And by the way, that 12.5 came during a period of time that inflation was relatively high. So it wasn't the, what you're thinking in terms of how much money you'd have at the end of that 40, because when you inflation adjusted, 
you weren't that much different from what you would have gotten if you'd gotten 8.9, something people totally over, well, I can't say totally overlook, but it's the biggest enemy we have other than ourselves, inflation, because it is a guaranteed bear market as far as I'm concerned. Whereas when the S&P 500 goes down 30 or 40 or 50%, yeah, that's a bear market and it hurts but it has always come back. Tell me how the people who 50 years ago had a dollar that is now worth about 12 cents, tell me how they're gonna get that back. Right. Of course, that tends to point to the stock market to have done that for them. We don't know if it'll happen next time. That's the, that's the problem we have versus the work that you do where you're telling people, I, and I'm guessing this, but most people who believe what you believe will say, I only deal with the industry, part of the industry, insurance industry, where they guarantee something, that that's what I'm hiring them to do. Well, we can't guarantee anything. We can't even guarantee that, we can't even come close to guaranteeing that we think the market's going to do a certain thing over the next year, what we should then follow that with is, but there's a very good chance that it will go down 30%. I challenged a guy recently. I called him on the phone. He was on a national uh, um, uh, interview and somebody asked what he thought that the, the uh, crypto, the, the uh, Bitcoin would be a year from now. He said 150000 thousand mm-hmm. dollars i i had to call him and, and <laughs> what did he say he comes out of the academic community see the, i mean if that come out of a broker's mouth i yeah. said oh well that makes sense but <laughs> out of an academic and i said what are how did you justify that comment because people are going to listen to you right and say oh and by the way he mentioned that he put money in it he recently bought it he said Okay. So I wanted to know how much. Turned out he bought a little tiny bit. So, <laughs> so the implication of 150000 and I just bought it, whoa, you mean like you're selling it to your mom? Yeah, I'm putting my mom in it. You remember brokers used to use those sure. kind of lines. They, still do, they still do, by the way, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I asked him about the 150000 and he said, they didn't give me the time to oh. give the rest of the story. Oh. What I wanted to say was, it will be between 150,000 and 25,000. Correct. To which I wanted to say, how could you justify 25,000? <laughs> but I didn't have the guts because I was already picking on him. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, the stories that we hear, if we allow those stories to drive us they're driving us more than likely in a way, and this is important because now sex becomes part of this this process. Now I know when this it, podcast yeah, is going to be bring popular. It up. I'm this not is trying fantastic. to attract viewers. I just want to talk about sex. <laughs> okay, let's talk about sex and the market. Sex, food, and money are not intellectual decisions. They are emotional decisions. And if you will just read one of my favorite books of all times, Your Money and Your Brain by Jason Zweig. Yeah. And what you will understand is, yes, not only is your neighbor a little crazy about their financial decisions, but look at your own. And when I say crazy, you'll find they are not intellectual decisions. What we're trying to do is bring people down. Don't do this based on your feelings. If you invest based on your feelings, then how are you going to sell? Well, guess what? You're going to sell based on your feelings. Oh my God, Martha, if we lose any more money, we're not going to be able to retire. We got to get rid of that dog. Right. Well, those are the, uh, which is why so many people need an advisor because they can't deal with all these on their own. I have no idea what your question was, but no, there that you was, go. No, that was fantastic. And, and I, what I was going to interject, I'm listening to you. You just can't hide passion. I know people on the, that are listening and viewing this, they're like, man, he is passionate about it. Yes, he is. He is passionate about it. Which leads me to a question I didn't even have on my list, which is, who is your mentor? Like, how did you get into this? And how did you, 
how did this become the passion? Because no one wakes up in the morning and go, you know what? I want to be either Stan the annuity man or I want to be Paul Merriman and, and, and look at markets. Go back you know, in time a little bit because I'd like to know that story. I'm sure our listeners and viewers would as well. You know, my, my mentors, and I must have a thousand of them, and I really mean that. My mother was a mentor. Uh, and he, she mentored me by teaching me, and I really mean this, be nice to everybody you meet in your life. Well, wow. And try it, if you want to be a success, just try to figure out how you can help a person and you will be a success. My stepfather, who I absolutely hated, was a mentor. <laughs> okay. He made me afraid to even come into the room he was in because... He was physically and he was verbally and he was emotionally abusive. He really wished I didn't exist. I was screwing up things with my mother, I'm sure. <laughs> but I learned from him. I learned how to survive with that guy by figuring out what's on his mind. <laughs> what can I do to make him happy? Wow. But then I met people along the way who taught me how to help people invest. And I learned some things. For example, Ed put his arm around my shoulder when I went into the brokerage business. And he said, Paul, you got to understand this business. This business is not about making money for people. I was 22. I thought, wow, how can that be? That's why I came into the business. Right. He said, no, it's about creating loyalty. It should be as difficult to fire us as it would be to kick a child out of a home. And I learned, I mean, that I cannot wow. forget that conversation. And that's one of the reasons I left the business after less than three years, because it was not built to help people. In fact, I was taught you got to make a lot of money during the bull markets. When things are up and they're crazy, you got to keep selling because that's when people want to buy. So then I got out of the industry and I met other mentors along the way that changed my life. But at age 40, I cashed in what I had been doing and I started my investment advisory firm. It was not originally Merriman Wealth Management, by the way, Stan, because my minimum size account was $2,000. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> that did not qualify I hear as you. wealth. But, but I was just having a good time because theoretically, I was a member of the FIRE group. I just didn't realize I was a, an early retiree because I'm a workaholic. So even when I'm playing, I do it like a workaholic. Right. But I learned from people what is, in fact, in their best interest. And when I sold my, well, let me just do one more thing. And this is not a sales pitch. When I built my business, and I know other people who have built it the same way since I did this, and they have been very successful, I had classes. It's like what you're doing. I can't believe the education that you're giving people on your website. Yeah. And I direct people to you all the time. I said, go look at the YouTube pieces. Go, he'll send you a free library <laughs> of books on annuities. That's true. And I have never had one of those people come back to me and say a salesman called. Never. And, and you know, th this is what, this is what I did. And so I would teach three and six hour classes and show people how to do it all on their own. Wow. And then guess what? Some people won't. And so they knew what I believed and a lot of them hired us to do it for them. So when I retired, and this is partly my wife's doing actually, because I was looking, what am I going to do next? And uh, within weeks, I was writing the column for Market Watch. Uh, within months, I was underwriting a course at Western Washington University up mm -hmm. in Bellingham, Washington, where I graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, then be because of a mentor, a guy named Tom Cock, Tom helped me learn how to do podcasts. And he actually helped us have a radio show uh, locally in uh, Seattle when we had our firm. A great, an amazing mentor and a very dear friend. In fact, most of my mentors 
with the exception of my stepfather, have become <laughs> really good friends over my life. So I built the business based on helping others. And when you're, you know, if you're a brain surgeon, you don't have to be that way. I mean, you, you just do your work. Right. Uh, but I suspect, I suspect they're trying to do their best work too, helping others. But you know something, when you're in the world of sales, there's a fork in the road. You can help others in a fair way and do okay. Uh, and I'm going to tell you one of my mentors in just one second about that. Or you can do it in a way that you rape and pillage. Yeah. And you end up with all the goodies. I spent 90 minutes with John Bogle back in 19, uh, 2017. And one of the things that came out of that conversation, his absolute commitment to the small investor the reason he didn't want to do some of the things that I believe that he should do in terms of educating his investors mm -hmm. is he was afraid they wouldn't do it. And that if they didn't do it, it would hurt them rather than help them. And, uh, and he also, uh, and he literally wiggled his finger at me, you know, kind of like one of these. <laughs> right. He said, you're making things too complex. If you want to help people, you've got to simplify it. And we've done that. Mm -hmm. We have developed portfolios that used to take 13 funds, and now it takes four funds, or even better yet, two funds. And one of my mentors works with me, Chris Pedersen. Uh, he's our director of research. Uh, he's been an amazing mentor to me. So uh, you never know. And that started, by the way, with That's a little true. email he sent to me asking if I could use some help. <laughs> Little did he know he was going to end up helping me be a lot better at what I think we're doing. So there you so, go. So when the Merriam and the people, we're going to give the, give, go ahead and give the site to the people. We're going to put it on, on my website as well. What's the website they can go to to look at what you do? PaulMerriman.com. And the Merriman Financial Education Foundation and, the, and PaulMerriman.com, when people go there, what, what type of services do you offer? What can they look for? Well, the commitment in our mission is to helping people at all stages of life. And okay. I consider birth uh, to 21 as one of those stages. Okay. So you're going to find articles, podcasts, books, uh, and, and, and by the way, recommendations to other people I think you can trust in these arenas. Sure. Uh, trying to help people do the right thing. And I'm not talking just about here's what a mutual fund is. I'm talking about not only suggesting that you probably based on this table, because I got me out of over 160 tables that we have that investors can use. See, I'm, I'm trying to help the do it yourselfer. Got it. And you're not really, I mean, you're trying to be the intermediary between somebody who normally has no idea what they need, and then you're going to put them together with a product that's right for their needs. I am trying to leave a message in the mind of these people that when I am 77, Stan, I haven't got long. And when <laughs> I die, I'm expecting, because I'm covering all stages. We have laid the, grain, the groundwork. It's basic, it'll change, which is why I'm leaving money to support the foundation after I die. I wanted to go on and keep doing this work. But the bottom line is to educate, 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 and then to motivate to action, which means we actually have to be able to give them the actual mutual funds or ETFs to invest. So we have portfolios at Vanguard, at Fidelity, nice. at Schwab. Nice. Uh, we have the best in class. Chris Pedersen's put this together. The best in class recommendations with ETFs. People love ETFs. What ETFs? He's done the homework, by the way. Totally, totally volunteer. Does not get paid one penny for the hundreds of hours that he puts in every year. That's and fantastic. Hundreds of hours. And, and you know, we're trying to do something similar 
you know, I do think the annuity industry is eventually going to go to a direct to consumer platform. We are as close as you can get because you can go to our site and run quotes on your own and no one's going to call yes. you and we, we treat you like love a that you can get rates and all that stuff. Um, but what I'd like to do in the kind of the final segment of this podcast, which has been fantastic. And by the way, for the people that are watching this on the, uh, on the fun with annuities, YouTube channel, you can see that the sunshine in the state of Washington. Oh crazy. my yeah. God. This is, or this, yeah, this is Oregon. No, it's right Oregon. Now yeah, you're in Oregon. That's right. Um, Gearheart, Oregon. And there's a special sun comes to <laughs> Gearheart. So, and so I would get up not, and go pull the shade down. But if you're folks can stand it, Damn, no, I, I think love that no, I think I think we take the sun. No, we take the sun. I just want to let the, my viewers know that that's not some weird lighting thing we're doing with Paul. That's it's right. just the, I have just become a bandit. I can see it right now. <laughs> that's the pure. That's the pure uh, sunshine. Let's go through a couple of 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 the items and the topics in your new book. Um, maybe choose one or two that you think they're all important, but maybe choose one or two and let's talk about those. So I'll I'll let you choose which one or two that you want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. That is a blessing. At the, the book is kind of two parts. The first part is about the 12 major, major, huge decisions. The last half of the book is about what is the best general investment product that has ever been invented. It's not the mutual fund. It's, uh, it, 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 isn't, uh, uh, it isn't even index funds. It's the target date fund because the target date fund, what does it do that's so special? It allows a person who absolutely has no interest in doing anything about their investments, but is scared to death of going to Wall Street, scared to death of going in the stock market on their own, but they want the money in the hands of somebody that's truly gonna act in their best interest. And boy, a target date, at a fund at Vanguard. You can, and there are others, by the way, sure, that are sure. very good as well. But you can put your money in the target 2065, because that's when you think you're going to retire. All right? They're going to do everything an old fashioned pension fund manager would do. They would be changing your portfolio from mostly equities to mostly bonds as you age and you reach retirement. They know that you're young and you're in these great working years where you're worth a lot to others because you're a worker bee. And they also know that later in your life, you're not worth so much to others and you've <laughs> got to be able to take care of and, and make the payroll for yourself. Mm -hmm. So you literally, with one investment and one decision out of all of them, could latch on to a strategy and the management at a very, very, very low expense. Expenses are important to your bottom line and be there until you're 91. But that's not the end of that part of the, of the book. Then we show you, this is the second thing that I, I, I think is really important. And that is not, equities. I mean, that's huge. I already mentioned that. But what equities? Well, the target date fund has almost all the equities that you probably need, except for one combination, small companies and value companies. And so we do our best to give you an education. How If you just put in 10%, instead of putting all your money in that target date fund inside your 401k, if you have a small cap value fund access in that 401k, great, put 10% there, 90% in the, uh, in the target date fund. Just do that every month for the rest of your life until you retire. At that point, you might want to take out the small cap value because it could be a very, very big part of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so we give you the evidence. And what would that lead to? What do we know from the past? it looks like it would add about 30% on average to what you would have otherwise had when you retire. Well, you may not think that's a big deal, but if instead of a million, you have a million three, and you haven't taken outrageous risk to get it, particularly when you start, what does that mean? Well, if you're living on 4% a year, you're instead of $40,000, sounds to me like you're making $52,000. Is that a life changer? 
Well, it is. If what happens is it keeps going up over time, both of them going up, but the one that's got the better rate of return is likely to give you more income in retirement and leave more to your kids. Literally, for every half a percent, and this is an important fact in the book, if you just do the computation, every half a percent more that you make on your investments adds between a million and a million and a half dollars over your lifetime, even if you're only putting away $5,000 a year over 40 years. Well, most of you are going to put away a lot more than that. Sure. Interesting. So, where, where do people buy this book? Where do they get it? Well, they can get it at, at Amazon. And if they want to know how others feel, I hope you will take the time to read what others say about it. And a lot of those people are college kids and young, young adults. And that's that this book is really built for the 20s and the 30s, maybe even the 40s. They and get the get title because the title's a killer. I love it. What's the title? That's, uh, we're talking millions. We're talking 12 millions. simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And the give, problem me, give me number one. Let's do number one and number 12. What's number one? Well, number one is the save. Got to save. Uh, and, and, and saving is difficult for people. But Warren Buffett, I think he's got a great answer. Don't save what's left over after spending. Spend what's left over after saving. Every study concludes nice. that people who just simply say, take it, get it out of my life. This is like a 401k where it's automatically taken. You never see it. That's the way a pension fund was built. Money that just was automatically take, taken out of your income. They right. could have given that money to you. You didn't have a choice. They just did it because they wanted to be parental and right. take care of you, make sure you had money. Because most people, we know this, most people will not put the money aside. Well, probably because they think they can't afford it. But it only takes pennies. Yep. One dollar a day, Stan. One dollar a day for a newborn child through 65, millions, millions, can be as much as four millions if you happen to put that money historically in small cap value, one dollar a day. All right, we're not gonna give away all of this because we want people to go and get the book because it's worth it, every single penny. What's number 12? Target date fund. Target date fund. Yeah. The, yeah. other, the other ones in the middle, you're going to have to get the book. But what I do encourage everyone to do is go to Paul's site. And again, we're going to have that on our, on our website. This is, not, this is not Paul's last appearance on the Annuity Man podcast, Fun with Annuities, because as you, as you notice, we really didn't talk about annuities. Now, you know, the way that Paul and I probably agree upon annuities is, is as part of the income floor, that guaranteed income that you want to hit your bank account every single month, you know, it, it does make you a better investor, in my opinion, if you have that already, you know, at least a portion of it in place, because everyone already owns the best inflation annuity on the planet, and that's called Social Security. So people can't hate all annuities and then yeah. say, yeah, where's my Social Security payment? But um, this has been fantastic. And I think- Can I add something? I, yeah. I, have you got time? I mean, Yeah, I, absolutely. If it's going to stop. No, we, no we've got, we've yeah, got some let me, time. Let me tell you why I refer people to you. And, and, I, and I tell them where else they can go check on stuff on the internet. But I have not found anybody yet who educates people the way that you do. But here is where you come up so Thank often. You. I find a lot of people do not have the desire- or really the wherewithal to take any risk with their portfolio. They should not take any risk. Mm -hmm. And I also know uh, in all of those workshops that I did back, back in the 80s and the 90s, I would ask, how many of you have a pension? And a whole bunch of arms would go up. And they did it with gusto. I mean, they were happy to say, <laughs> I have a pension. And, and then I would ask, for how many of you is that pension the greatest financial luxury in your life? Almost every hand stand mm -hmm. went up because they could guarantee that monthly income. And then 
when I'm talking, and they never questioned that the pension was a good thing to do. Now, some right. of them thought, oh, right. God, if I could just get my hands on that money, I could double it every year in the stock market. But sure. for most people, just to take the pension was the right thing to do. Today, we don't have those pensions. But I, when I am talking with somebody, and I don't give investment advice individually, so right. I don't want to sound like I'm holding myself out to people. But right. when I'm talking to somebody, let's say a friend, and they tell me that, that they don't really have enough to make it. And I say, have you considered an annuity, a single premium, immediate annuity? And they say, well, that's an insurance product, right? Oh, no, I don't want any insurance products <laughs> in my portfolio. The fact is, a pension is an insurance product. That's correct. And that, so here's the thing that is so wonderful is that you can buy the pension. You don't have to depend. If you did saved all your own money in a 401k, and then you wanted to guarantee a stream of the same thing a pension would give you, that's what you can do. You can buy it. The problem is, and where I'm, I'm so leery, is where do they buy it? I agree. Because I mean, you mentored me on this, Stan. I mean, I want to give you credit as a mentor. You showed me the range of payouts that people would get from a whole bunch of well-known companies. Sure. Some are not so well-known because they're, sure. they're not generally on TV to see, <laughs> but what their payouts would be. And in one case, and I'm not saying that this is what they're paying today, but it was what they were paying then. Sure. There was about a two, three hundred dollar difference a month, a month between New York Life paying less than one that that was the same quality company. And you had to explain to me. I had no idea. I was asking you, is that a ripoff of some sort? And then you explained to me how these insurance companies work and why there are these big differences. And they're commodity products. And that's the reason that we're very proud of the platform we put together, which is a, a non-bias toward any carrier. We represent them all. You quote all these companies for the highest contractual guarantee. Um, and, and, and quotes change like a gallon of milk every seven to 10 days. So you can't fall in love with the name. You got to fall in love with the number. But, um, but I really appreciate that. And you know, I've learned a ton on this this podcast. I do recommend people going to uh, to Paul's site. Paul will be back with us. But it has been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you getting up early in the beautiful Oregon sunlight. Oh yeah, and joining us. Um, <laughs> but that, I think we've kind of maxed out the time. I mean, I uh, he, you know I told you. It'd well, be... I got to make one more offer, Stan. Sure. I'm sorry. I am no, so please sorry. do one more. If somebody cannot afford my book. I want them to email paul at paulmerriman.com and I will send them a free PDF. And I'll also do that for a student or I'll do that for a teacher. There you go. That's Actually, I'd like to do it for every person on earth, but that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be, be honorable with Paul's offer, but he is, a, he is he's just a gracious man and, and, a general, and generally just, a, you, you know, he's just such a, a good person. And, and in the financial services world, that's tough to say a lot of times because, you know, we've been in it a long time, but there are some good people. That's the reason he's on this podcast. I want you to, if you didn't know about him all, most of you probably heard of Paul, but if you haven't heard of Paul, please go to his site, please, you know, look at his information and follow his, his, you know, it's not investment advice, but his overall views of how markets work, and you know his staff doing the research, it is worth it's worth you going to a site. But with that, I think we got to close it out. I really appreciate you Thanks. being with us, Paul, and Thanks. I appreciate all you listeners and viewers. And I'll see you next week on Fun with Annuities. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice 
you will ever get. And that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities. Annuities.